Hi, it's uh, Sandy. So I'm going live. I'm going to tell you why. I like going live. I don't really know about planning videos and all that stuff, so I just go live at the spur when it hits me to do it. Sometimes I plan for for really good research pieces, and today it's not a research piece. It's something I came across and I thought, oh my God, I've got to read this and share with you guys because it's it's like the more I'm down the rabbit hole and the more I read and the more I understand and the more I'm with, I don't know, maybe it is the echo chamber of this is this part because I think we do get stuck in an echo chamber. Uh, I feel like certain things just hit me, you know, like certain articles and this one is is hitting me so I'm gonna read this and it's from the Guardian it's from the Guardian and uh, this is the dude if you can see it see that's the dude and his name is uh, Meyer Hillman we're doomed mayor Hillman on the climate reality no one else will dare to mention so he's 86 year old social scientist okay he says Accepting the impending end of most life on Earth might be the very thing needed to help us prolong it. Quote, we're doomed, unquote, says Meyer Hillman, with such a beaming smile that it takes a moment for the words to sink in. The outcome is death. And it's the end of most life on the planet because we're so dependent on the burning of fossil fuels. There are no means of reversing the process, which is melting the polar ice caps, and very few appear to be prepared to say so. <laughs> what I think. Hillman, an 86-year-old social scientist and senior fellow emeritus of the Policy uh, Studies Institute, he does say so, his bleak forecast of the consequence of runaway climate change, he says without fanfare, is his last will and testament. His last intervention in public life. I'm not going to write anymore because there's nothing more that can be said, he says when I first hear him speak to a stunned audience at the University of East Anglia late last year. From Malthus to lunch policymakers' conventional wisdom. In 1972, we criticized out-of-town shopping centers more than 20 years before the government changed planning rules to stop their spread. In 1980, he recommended halting the closure of branch line railways. Only now are some closed lines reopening. In 1984, he proposed energy ratings for houses, finally adopted as a, a government policy in 2007. <laughs> And more than 40 years ago, he, he prescient, sorry, presciently challenged society's pursuit of economic growth. Sounds familiar. You know, a lot of people have done this, but he's uh, interesting. When we meet at his uh, converted coach house in London, his classic Dawes racer still parked hopefully in the hallway a stroke and a triple heart bypass mean he is currently forbidden from cycling. Holman is anxious that we are not sidetracked by his best known research, which challenged the supremacy of the car. With doom ahead, making a case for cycling as the primary mode of transport is almost irrelevant. He says, we've got to stop burning fossil fuels. So many aspects of life depend on fossil fuels, except for music and love and education and happiness. These things, which hardly use fossil fuels, are what we must focus on. While the focus of Hillman's thinking for the last quarter century has been on climate change, he's best known for his work on road safety. He spotted the damaging impact of the car on the freedoms and safety of those without one. Most significantly children, decades ago. Some of his policy prescriptions have become commonplace, such as 20 mile per hour speed limits, but we failed to curb the car's crushing of children's liberty. In 1971, 80% of British seven and eight-year-old children went to school on their own. 
today, <laughs> it's virtually unthinkable that a seven-year-old would walk to school without an adult. That's in the United States, too. I'm sure it's in a lot of places. Uh, it's, you know, the westernized civilization. He does sound like that. Hi, Fiesta. Cranberry joined us. Oh, I'm so happy. Thanks, hon. I'm glad you're with me. Um, let me go back to this. So as Hillman pointed out, we've removed children from danger rather than removing danger from children and filled roads with polluting cars on school runs. He calculated that escorting children took 900 million adult hours in 1990. Oh, he's costing um, the economy 20 British pounds each year. It would be even more expensive today. Our society's failure to comprehend the true cost of cars has informed Hillman's view on the difficulty of combating ch climate change. But he insists that I must not prevent, present his thinking on climate change as an opinion. The data is clear. The climate is warming exponentially. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that the world on its current course will warm by 3C. By 2100, revised, recently revised climate modeling suggests a best estimate of 2.8 C centigrade. But scientists struggle to predict the full impact of the feedbacks from future events, such as the methane being released by the melting of the permafrost. <laughs> Hillman, he is amazed that our thinking rarely stretches beyond 2100. This is what I find so extraordinary when scientists warn that the temperature could rise to 5C or 8C. What? And stop there. What legacies are we leaving for future generations? In the early 21st century, we did as good as nothing in response to climate change. Our children and grandchildren are going to be extraordinarily critical. Global emissions were static in 2016. Uh... Um, but the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was confirmed as beyond 400 parts per million. The highest level for at least 3 million years when sea levels were up to 20 um, mil milliliters, millimeters higher than now. See, I'm a dumb American. Concentrations can only drop if we emit no carbon dioxide What? So ever, says Hillman, even if the world went zero carbon today, that would not save us because we've gone past the point of no return. Although Hillman has not flown for more than 20 years as part of a personal commitment to reducing carbon emissions, he is now scornful of individual action, which he describes as good as futile. By the same logic, says Hillman, national action is also irrelevant because Britain's contribution is minute. Even if the government were to go to zero carbon, it would make almost no difference. Instead, says Hillman, the world's population must globally move to zero emissions across agriculture, air travel, shipping and heating homes, every aspect of our economy, and reduce the human population too. Can you see everyone in, in democracy um, volunteering to give up flying? And do, do you think all of that can be done without a collapse of civilization? I don't think so, says Hillman. Can you see the majority of the population becoming vegan? Can you see the majority agreeing to restrict the size of their families? I talked about this earlier on something on Facebook on the show that Nikia did from um, British Columbia. Hillman doubts that human ingenuity can fix and says there is no evidence that greenhouse gases can safely be buried. But if we adapt to a future with less focusing on Hillman's love and music, it might be good for us. And who is we? Asks Hillman with the typically impish smile. Wealthy people will be better able to adapt, but the world's population will head to regions of the planet, such as Northern Europe, which will be temporarily spared the extreme effects of climate change. When do we go? <laughs> How are these regions going to respond? We see it now. Migrants will be prevented from arriving, and 
we will let them down. A small band of artists and writers, such as Paul Kings North's Dark Mountain Project, have embraced the idea that civilization will soon end in environmental catastrophe, but only a few scientists unwilling, I mean, usually working beyond the patronage of funding bodies and nearly the end of their own lives, have suggested as much. In Hillman's view, a consequence of old age and ill health? I was saying these sorts of things 30 years ago when I was hale and hearty, he says. Hillman accuses all kinds of leaders, from religious leaders to scientists to politicians, of failing to honestly discuss what we must do to move to zero carbon emissions. I don't think they can because society isn't organized to enable them to do so. Political parties' focus is on jobs and gross domestic product, depending on the burning of fossil fuels. <laughs> Without hope goes the truism, we will give up. And yet optimism about the future is wishful thinking, says Hillman. He believes that accepting that our civilization is doomed could make humanity rather like an individual who recognizes he is terminally ill. Such people rarely go on a disastrous binge. Instead, they do all they can to prolong their lives. Can civilization prolong its life until the end of this century? It depends on what we are prepared to do. He fears it will be a long time before we take proportionate action to stop climate calamity. Standing in the way is capitalism. Can you imagine the global airline industry being dismantled when hundreds of new runways are being built right now all over the world? It's almost as if we're deliberately attempting to defy nature. We're doing the reverse of what we should be doing with everybody's silent acquiescence and no one is batting an eyelid. That article, I, I think that... How many of us could have written that? How many of us feel like this? Holy crap. But it's hard to talk about it out there. It's hard to talk about this stuff like this, even on my Facebook page. And people, they freak out. Or, you know, what I find, they would rather, the people that get 7,000, 8,000, whatever, and it's it, like I've said, it's not about views, but the people that do that are the ones that are talking wackadoodle, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, all kinds of different things. I don't have to say what they're talking about. You get my drift. I'm talking about this reality. Hambone's talking about this reality. Kevin's talking about this reality. Um, Derek, all of these people are talking about reality, but the people that are talking about chemtrails and the people that are talking about Agenda 21, and I keep hitting the table because I'm so emotional after reading this. They're the ones that get all the attention, and it's just taking it away. So they're everyone, when it happens or when the shit hits the fan or whatever's going to happen, nobody is going to be ready. And even, even, even sounding the alarm, you know? And I sound like an alarmist, right? I sound like a crazy alarmist. And I don't want to. But it's, it's, it's just the fact. And I don't know where the thing is I'm looking at, but it's it's just happening. It's the fact. It's happening. It is what is happening. And peace.